everyone. Uh, welcome to a new day. We're going to uh, begin our study on uh, putting judges on a line, but before we begin, can we begin with a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are so very thankful for this morning, for all the blessings of, of the studies that we have had in the past, and we invite your spirit to continue to give us light and understanding. I pray, Lord, that you can help us as we look at this chronology and as we put the line of the judges, especially of Judges chapter 4, into our history. We pray, Lord, that you can guide and direct in how we do that, that your Holy Spirit can speak to each of our hearts and minds, and that we can see clearly the time that we are in. And uh, we pray, Lord, that... Um, uh, you can help me in presenting, that I can um, simplify these things in a way that we can uh, take them home with us in our own minds and hearts, and that we can share them with others. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning again. And um, yesterday we... We looked at a bunch of chronological um, issues that had arisen with the numbering of the tribes. And what I wanted to do was to, to show people what the difficulties are, how complex this is. And that is, we have all of this information, and the only way that we can understand it is if we put it on a line properly. Now, we have Judges chapter 4, which we're understanding to be referencing um, a period of time in our movement um, that would start with Parminder in 2012 and would continue uh, all the way to 2023. That's my understanding of it. That is, that's what this chronology shows us, at least to, to 2023, um, if not further. Now, what, what we need to do, if we remember when we were going through uh, the story of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, what is it that we noticed? What was the primary understanding of the structure of the lines that we got from studying that history? What did we learn about the lines? I know that's a, a big question. But. We had some points, especially about the structure of how Joseph interrelates with many of the of the issues and points that we face right now. Okay. Well, we can see, definitely see that um, we can take these reform lines and we can apply them. To our time and each of these are specific that is Abraham Isaac and Jacob are the first second and third angels message and Joseph would be the fourth angels message right the repeat of history so it, it, it's but each of these reform lines are also typifying that is each of these way marks in a reform line are also typifying a reform line Right, so we had Abraham, he has his own personal reform line, correct? Right. And we, and we could see that even with Moses, he has his own personal reform line. And Miller has his own reform line. And that reform line would be addressing uh, the first angel's message. So when we look at our history, um, we have a reform line that we are presently in, but the question is, what reform line is that? So um, before we look at these uh, scriptures here, we're, we're going to just go over these reform lines. So <clears throat> I'd already drawn it up there, but I'm going to erase that and do it over again. Just in a second here. So as a question, as you're, as you're getting into this. Yeah. 
Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, resent, representing the messages of Revelation 14. Yeah. Joseph representing the other angel of Revelation 18. Yep. And then you have Moses. So does Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph represent the Millerite time frame and then Moses represent our line and our time frame? Um, okay, well, I'll answer this question here. So you got Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then you have Joseph, right? So this is the first, second, third, and this is the fourth is the way that we understand this. Now that's going to be true that Abraham has a reform line, Isaac has a reform line, Jacob has a reform line, and Joseph has a reform line, which is the fourth. But each of these have a reform line. That is when we zoom into a way mark, we have a reform line. And the way that uh, Parminder had done this, is he had taken these and he had staggered them like this, right? And so he would say, well, the time of the end for this reform line, uh, you know, this is gonna be the second angel's message for midnight, I guess. And this would be the beginning of the time of the end for the next reform line. And then the midnight for that reform line. Now this is somewhat correct, but it's not like this. That is, there are overlappings of reform lines, but it's not so simplistic. And it occurs that there are events in Isaac's life, in his personal reform line, that are also part of Jacob's, right? And, and part of Abraham's that are part of Isaac's as well. So, so you can see that when we zoom into a reform line like this, when we zoom into a way mark, we expect to have a first, second, and third angel's message. And mostly what you get is you get a first and then second angel's message and an arrival of a third angel's message. Now there are major reform lines, and then there are uh, reform lines that are way marks within those reform lines. In a sense, I mean, this reform line here is a zoom into a reform line on the bigger line going from creation uh, lost to creation restored, right? So from, or from creation to the, the new earth, from the, the original earth to the new earth. Now, one of the things we know, if we look at Millerite history, from the perspective of Ellen White, is you're going to have uh, these reform lines. So, um, you're going to have always a message arrives. Uh, first angel is formalized. First angel is empowered. Second angel arrives. The second angel is formalized. The second angel is empowered. And then the third angel arrives. And then Ellen White's going to extend this. And she's going to put the Sunday law here. So hopefully you can see all that. <clears throat> now, the third angel arriving, when we look at this history, what, what we had done, and, and this is a bit of a review, but remember that Jeff originally just had a reform line that looked like this, first, second, and third. And, and he would take our history and put the time of the end here, and he would put what here originally what would he put on these other three so this is the first this is the second so remember before 9 11. didn't he have mid midnight midnight crime 
No. Okay. Long before he even conceived of these ideas. So when he had his original reform line, he's going to have the third is going to be the close of probation. And this is going to be the Sunday law. Does that make sense? All right, that's that's history. There you go. Yeah. So this is how how Jeff first conceived of it. Now, when he put the time at the end, this is going to be 1989, and he's going to parallel parallel it to the empowerment of the first angel in Millerite history. Um. And and the Sunday law, he's not going to be, um, like he's going to. He's not going to really have it lined up in this way with Millerite history. He's just going to have the second angel's message. Right. And then we're going to have the close of probation. And this would be the close of the probation. So he doesn't have the third angel's message arrive as being the Sunday law initially. He just has this as the second angel's message because the second angel's message, this here now that we've divided, divided, he would just see the second angel's message because as Ellen White said, we're paralleling Millerite history. We have the first angel's message and the second angel's message. And here we would have the loud cry, which would parallel the midnight cry. So if this is Millerite history, this would be the midnight cry. Right? This would be the arrival of the second angels when the door were closed on Seventh-day Adventist in 1842. And then they have the midnight cry, and then they have the close of probation. That was Millerite history. And Ellen White parallels these two. She parallels the midnight cry with the loud cry. So initially, we never had a midnight, midnight cry prior to the Sunday law. So this is pre-9-11. Now, when 9-11 occurred, we ended up with... Um, uh, a different reform line. So you're going to, we're going to keep this here. But then we're going to have um, <clears throat> time of the end, 9-11 and the Sunday law. So the Sunday law now becomes the close of probation after 9-11. And, and then and gradually he moves the empowerment of the message over to here. But it, it takes him some time. It, do, it doesn't just happen overnight. It takes him time because he's going to look at the empowerment of the message of the first angel's message here at the time of the end, even though that doesn't because he's going to compare the fall of the Soviet Union with the fall of Turkey. But, but this becomes his, his line. But then what ends up happening is we then move 9-11 over here. That is, this is the empowerment of the first angel's message becomes this way, Mark. So the time of the end is over here. And 9-11 um, becomes this step. So you can see this isn't really the, this is the empowerment of the first angel's message. But it's also going to be the arrival of the second angel. So there just becomes this, this shift. What, what Jeff begins to do is he takes the line that Ellen White had originally given us. And Ellen White, she has this Sunday law way, Mark. And, and Jeff is going to take the mighty angel of Revelation 18 coming down as being the Sunday law. That's something in the future. But we have this repeat of history before the Sunday law. But as the movement progresses, we continue to zoom in to this history. And what we finally end up with is, is this. So we end up with midnight um, being here, but it's it doesn't really look like this. It's not the first, second, and third angel's message now. It's a zooming into a history where we're going to have midnight and the midnight cry. 
9 11 is going to be the first day of the first month this is going to be the fifth day of the fourth month and this is the first day of the fifth month and this is the tenth day of the seventh month right so this is 2016 this is more what we're familiar with in this movement now so what he has done is he has zoomed in and this way mark that he had never originally had uh, becomes part of this Sunday law way mark. So this is the second angel's message, right? This isn't even like the first angel's message. 9-11 serves the purpose as the second angel arriving. But it also serves the purpose as the first angel being empowered. So it serves these two purposes. And of course, you have the time at the end over here. But this is going to be the first angel's message. This is going to be the second. And this is going to be the third angel empowered. Is, is anybody have questions about this? Okay, so where would the third angel be formalized? Uh, 1888. But we're dealing with a repeat right now. Oh, in our history? Yes. Okay, so our history doesn't have a formalization of the third angel's message. The third angel's message is simply empowered. We, we don't have the, the first angel's message arrives at the time of the end in the repeat of history. The second angel's message arrives at 9-11. But the third angel's message has continued all the way from here, from October 22, to the Sunday law, this is still the third angel's message continuing, right? So the third angel's message doesn't arrive in our history because we're dealing with a repeat of only the first and second angel's messages. That is the parable of the 10 virgins has been fulfilled and will be fulfilled to the very letter. So it's the first and second angel's message that are the, that that are represented in the parable of the 10 virgins, according to Ellen White, the going forth of, of, of uh, the 10 virgins is going to be the first angel's message. And the tarrying time is represented in the second angel's message. The door closing is October 22nd, 1844. So in our history, we have to repeat the first and second angel's message. From 1989 to 9-11, we repeated the first angel's message. And 9-11 um, served the purpose as the empowerment of the first angel's message. But it also then served the purpose of the arrival of the second angel. And but doesn't, it, Mrs., doesn't Mrs. White also comment that that time would be the arrival of the other angel? the angel of revelation 18 okay so where she puts the arrival of the angel of revelation 18 is the sunday law we put the arrival here because what we didn't realize is that 9 11 marks uh the arrival of this other angel and that and if that's the case then this whole history is the sunday law so we're in the sunday law history with 9 11. But, but we're in this history in a repeat of history. That is, the Sunday law is still the Sunday law. Time when it's going to occur, and then you're going to have going with the angel of Revelation 14, the third angel, and they're going to swell into a loud cry, and then you're going to have a close of probation. And that's still the case. The loud cry comes after the Sunday law, but she uh, parallels the loud cry with the midnight cry. So when we have the midnight cry here, this isn't the midnight cry that she's talking about that follows the Sunday law in the big line. This is the midnight cry that is a repeat of history that precedes the Sunday law. So the big problem that this movement has is we believe that we're we've we believe that we're further along this line 
than we should. And that's because we haven't understood who we are and when we are. That is, we are a reform line and we're a reform line that is typifying the Sunday law. That is, it's a repeat of Millerite history. But that me repeat of Millerite history that has this midnight and midnight cry, what we would have to determine is that us is, are we here at the midnight cry coming up and, and that we're having the Sunday law ready and that this movement has prepared the Seventh-day Adventist church, the Levites, the ones who are looking for truth, that it has given a message that is going to prepare people for the Sunday law. If that's the case, can we, can we argue that this movement has done that? That is it fulfilled its role? Or are we zooming into one of these waymarks and maybe it's this waymark or maybe it's this waymark? And, and we're just the beginning of that way, Mark. Do people understand what I'm saying here? Because our history, this movement, FFA, and, and, and those that are in this movement, definitely cannot be this completely, what we've experienced cannot be this reform line. It can only be something, something that's typical of it. So this reform line is an example? Well, this reform line is what we have begun. But we're not here. No, we're, we're not, definitely not. And we're not here, and we're not even here yet. That is, I would say that we're here at the arrival of the second angel's message, and our reform line is a zoom in to 9-11. So if we're at the um, arrival of the second angel. Yeah. Our parallel with what was going on in Millerite history is we're at about the same point before the churches started to close their doors. Okay. Um, let me think about that. No, we have to be after April 19th because that's the arrival of the second angel in Millerite history. So that's after the churches started to close their doors? Well, the church started to close their doors in, in 42, right? But the second angel does not arrive until April 19th, 1844. So I would say that our reform line is typifying this history from the first day of the first month to midnight. And, and, and that's not this empowerment of the first angel. That is, there are two different ways that 9-11 could be understood. The empowerment of the first angel's message. And initially, 9-11 served that purpose. It served that pur purpose for one reform line. But for our movement, well, it's one of these. Either we are using 9-11 as the arrival of the empowerment of the first angel's message, or 9-11 serves the purpose of the arrival of the second angel's message, but not both for our reform line, for this movement. So that's one of the things we have to sort out. And, and I've sort of flip-flopped back and forth depending on things. That is, if you look at our reform line, what we have experienced is we still have November 9th, 1989. So no, that becomes the time of the end. And that doesn't change. The time of the end is November 9th, 1989. It's not going to be moving for different groups of people. What's going to change is those that receive light and when their reform line ends. So the ending of their reform line will change, but not the beginning of it. And then if, if you looked at this as the time of the end, we have put 1996 as the formalization of the message, and then you're going to have 9-11 uh, 
as the empowerment of the first angel's message. So the first angel is formalized and then the first angel is empowered. So, so with this group, there's going to be a rival of the second angel. And then the second angel is empowered. And then the third angel will be empowered. It doesn't arrive. So, so the question is, whose reform line is this? And what, what would we mark as the arrival of the second angel? Because what we would normally do is we just go here. Well, this is 9-11 as well. So one way we could look at this is this is 2014. So why would we put 2014 there? Oh, and I should put actually formalization here. I knew I was doing something wrong. And second angel in power. Okay, so why would I put a formal, uh, the arrival of the second angel is 2014? Anybody know? Wouldn't that be the, the point where, for, where Parminder's beginning to introduce some of his issues within the, within the movement? Okay, so yeah, so in 2014, so Parminder had predicted this date as the Sunday law. And, and I don't think he was wrong in, in a, on a certain level. He just never understood the lines and, and what that would mean for this movement. That is, he was looking at the Sunday law over here. And he's saying, well, 2014 is going to be that Sunday law. But all he was pointing to was something that was typical. Now, I would say that 2017 to 19 is the formalization of the message. But that's one way of looking at it. I, I might even... Um, you know, say this is 2020 and this is 2021. This is one way I could look at this. I'm not, I'm not saying that that's correct, but I could take this line and say what, what we experienced here was a reform line, and this reform line would be the reform line of FFA. I might even say this is 2014 to 2017. You know, there's different ways I could look at this. But if this is the reform line of FFA, then this would just be a zoom in to this way mark here, the arrival of the first angel's message, or the empowerment of the first angel's message, I mean. And this would include Jeff. Right. So Jeff would be part of this because he's FFA. He has to be part of it. Yeah. And and this reform line experienced something that then ended. That that reform line, but that reform line was simply the arrival of or not the arrival, the empowerment of the first angel. That is, it was 9-11 in one context only. And so this would be the reform line of 9-11. So obviously you can see some of these things go before 9-11. So you put 9-11 here and you would see that the empowerment of the first angel's message, 9-11, produces a reform line, which has been this movement, the movement of FFA, which was, but FFA doesn't exist anymore. So FFA's reform line is over and it ended December 25th, 2021. So then we would say, well, there's this purpose of 9-11, but could we look at 9-11 
as the arrival of the second angel and create another reform line that, that is similar to this reform line, but extends. And that's what I, I haven't done yet. Now, now, in some ways, this is review because we've gone through this before, but I don't think it's well understood. That is, the way that we have looked at the reform lines in the past, we, we, we basically took this and we just placed it here. We placed it after this, and we put a little reform line here, and that midnight and midnight cry are way marks prior to the Sunday law in the big reform line, right? So we would put a time at the end in there, and we would say there is a midnight and a midnight cry that should be on the big line, but there isn't, is there? Because midnight and the midnight cry are here on the big line. And over in this line, you would put, this is the third angel empowered, and you would put 1888 here as the third angel formalized on the big line. Because that's what Ellen White sees. But she recognizes since the first and second angels messages were rejected in her history, that they would have to be repeated again to Seventh-day Adventists for them to be prepared for the Sunday law. So she saw that this history has to occur, but she didn't put these as way marks on the big line. She simply recognized that there is a repeat of the parable of the Ten Virgins, which is what this movement has experienced, that had to precede the Sunday law. But we haven't experienced this entire line. We have only experienced 9-11 as it relates to the empowerment of the first angel's message. And you can see that because if you make this as July 18th, 2020, that is our message was mostly about Islam, right? Correct. And now Jeff kept wanting to make it about the Sunday law because he wanted it to be about Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45. But Islam took over. And so when we were looking at this and we made this prediction, finally, that prediction was the prediction connected to August 11th, 1840 by a period of 180 years, which is 0.5 of a year. And it was the prophecy that pointed to that, that gave us this. So, so we would have to say that this reform line, it's past. And, and we might even look at it that each of these way marks also has reform lines that we could examine. Right, because even here in this formalization of the message, we have a way mark we call midnight, which is, you know, um, or the midnight cry, which is October 13th, 2018. It exists here in this formalization of the message. And in this time period here, what we're doing is we're formalizing this message that's going to be talking about uh, what's going to be coming here. So, you know, how we define these dates in, in here might be different. There's different ways we could look at it. But just the general idea is that, um, this movement has been about this July 18th, 2020 prediction. And then the aftermath of that leading to, well, what would be the empowerment of the third angel. But in a sense, this would be really just the arrival of the third angel message, right? So it doesn't get empowered. There, there is going to be a Sunday law and, and maybe that's what we would look at 2021, dealing with the Sunday law from 20 to 2021 uh, that's being typified. But the, but the point is, we need to recognize that we're not way over here. That is, we're not over here in the big line. We're in something that's approaching the Sunday law. Because we know we haven't given a message. How can we talk about that we're somehow here, that we've warned the 
um, the Levites or something is going to happen that's going to empower this message, right? So we're looking for the second angel being empowered, maybe Trump becoming president or something like that. But this movement's not in any position to give a message, right? We demonstrated that with July 18th. So, so we're not in a position to do that. But what we're looking at here is when we start to look at judges, because we're talking about Parminder um, and, and the role that he played where we are in the lines. And we know that we're still dealing with that history. Parminder himself may be gone, but the ideas that he put into this movement are still primarily driving it. And that people haven't been able to shake uh, the enemy. They haven't been able to get under from under the oppression of the enemy. Okay, so I meant I spent a bit longer on that than I wanted to, but this to me is an important point now when we look at the next. Um, so in the book of Judges, we're going to have this remember we're starting at 9 11 and and we're going to be going to the sunday law and so in this history which is given us from judges chapter 2 this obviously is going to be 2001 and this is going to be 2023 you know probably january 11th 2023 right that's going to be the end of this line. Now, we put the Sunday law there. Is there a Sunday law being predicted? Some are trying to, yes. Right. So, so we'll put January 11, 2023. That's the end of Colin's prediction. Now, he's not predicting a Sunday law on that date. Just like we weren't predicting a Sunday law on December 25th, 2021. But symbolically, his chronology gives us that date. And, and that would be the end of that line of that history. Now, we then dealt with, in the judges, we're going to have um, these different uh, issues that arise. And then we mark them. So we're going to put here, uh, this is Othniel. Something like that, right? Right. And then number two is who comes after Othniel as a judge? Ehud. And then Shamgar. Yeah, so Shamgar. And now we're going to have Barak. And Deborah, right? Right. Barack and Deborah. Right. So if we're going to put this on a line, could we say that this is the arrival of the first angel's message? This is the second, uh, this is the formalization, this is empowerment, and this is the arrival of the second angel's message. So this is the first, this is the second. I mean, is that one way of looking at it? That would likely be a proper way of looking at it. Yeah, it, it, it's definitely we we could make this case for this, but you know there be, there's going to be complexities as we go through these different judges, exactly how we're going to place them. Now we put this as the message of repentance. For God to give us light, we needed this message of repentance, and so this happens with nine eleven. Now, with Ehud, what were the symbols that were attached with Ehud? Define the symbols. What do you mean? Well, things like the pillars of the colonnade when he goes out, uh, the door being locked or shut. Um, so, so we have different symbols, the names of people. That, um, he that had, he was left-handed, that his yeah. right his right hand was not available. 
Right. And we also know that um, he's he's going to go to Gilgal. There's going to be these images there and he's going to then turn back. Right. So right. what was so what was this representing in our movement as the enemy? And where did we place this? So did we place this as um, so who was the enemy specifically? You mean the very fat king? Yeah. Okay. And and who did he represent? Does he represent the Seventh Day Adventist Church? Protestant understanding was yeah. what I was approaching it. Yeah, so Protestant understanding that has made the church fat. We right. didn't quite say it that way. But Ehud is the message of the 2520 in the charts, right? Right. Okay, so this here is the work of the Holy Spirit. And then we had Shamgar. Now, Shamgar is very short, but what was Shamgar about? What, what message came to this movement? What error was being addressed? Because remember, this is going to be in the east. This is going to be in the west. We're going to have the Philistines here, but, but what, what is being represented by Shamgar? More of an empowerment, isn't it? Okay. So an empowerment of the 2520? Right. Now, when we put, we put a time here, we're just going to put here, I'm going to put it up here. We're going to say this is 2004, right? Okay. 2004, 2005, somewhere in there. Okay. Before the meetings in Oklahoma? Um, well, well, the 2520 comes in, I guess, technically in 2005. Right. And then you're going to have this empowerment of the message. And if I put 2012 here, what am I saying? What am, what am I marking? As, seven times. Hey, this is the seven times, right, in 2012. Right. And that's going to be what happens with uh, um, Newport. Exactly. Right. Okay. So we'll put here Newport. Now, Newport's in the West. Remember, the charts were first given, so the 1863 chart, which has the 2520 on it, but hidden. That's going to be Newport. Newport, um, it's not Rhode Island, Newport, um, Newport, New Maine. Newport, Maine, where, wherever it is, Newport something, and this is going to be Newport, Washington, Oregon, or Washington, Newport, Washington, right, so, uh, and, and you have Portland, Oregon, and Portland, Maine, um, Maine in the first one, this is, I can't remember, but anyway, so there's, this is a connection of the message of the 2520. But there's a new element being introduced here in 2012. That is a new understanding of the 2520 comes to this movement. That is a deeper understanding of the 2520, partly with Habakkuk's two tables and um, with the understanding of the complete understanding of the prophetic mirror that's going to be developed. It's in 2012 that I developed this as well. And we begin this work on chronology that's going to addressing uh, the 2520 that's going to open up. Now, in 2012, we're also going to have Parminder making, doing some time setting. So here, you know, maybe the best place to put Parminder might be 2014. Um, but he really is introduced it in 2012 as well. So a lot happens in 2012. But now you're going to have 2014 and you're going to have Parminder. Right? So this is going to be Parminder, I'll just say. 
not so much as a person, but as a message. And, and it has to do with time setting. Now, we say that we want to put this on a line itself. That is, Parminder's history obviously does this, doesn't occur in a year. It occurs, occurs over a period of time. And so that's what we're going to try to do this week, is we're going to try to, to put this into a lot more detail. Is this helpful so far? Well, it's a good beginning to have this on a line so that we can be considering it in this manner. Yeah, okay. Um, is there any questions about any of this? I'm finding the interrelation with Shamgar to be intriguing. Okay, can you explain a bit about that? Well, okay. We looked at, at Othniel. We then took a good look at, at this with Ahud. Now we're coming into this with Shamgar. There's very little that's being addressed with this with Shamgar. Yeah. But we're putting this as a, a third way mark on the line. Mm -hmm. Shamgar is the one that slays 600 Philistines. Mm -hmm. And the manner in which he slays them is quite blunt. <laughs> Yeah, and, and now it's with an ox goat, and we know that this, um, we looked at the symbol symbolism here. Um, so the symbolism of the ox goat had to do with, um, uh, what's the word, to plow, right? Well, no, I'm, yeah, the ox, I'm, ox, I'm, ox means plow. I'm, I'm addressing this in a different manner. Yeah. Okay, at that time, there were no smiths in Israel, right? Yeah. So they had to go to the Philistines to get their plows and their ox goads sharpened. Yeah. So that ox goad has been sharpened by the Philistines so the Philistines are being put to death by their, the fruit of their own labor. Does okay. that make sense? Well, maybe. Um, I just know that the goad means to instruct or teach. And the way that I look at this, and, and you may be correct, but I, I'm stuck on how I think. So I look at this as the line upon line instruction that's going to be... Um, become predominant in the movement. So, you know, people who were in the movement and you know, we did have lines before, but we're gonna to start to see that whiteboards are gonna be used and the drawing of lines and, and instruction in that way is gonna become predominant in the movement. So when I first came into movement in 2010 and I was at um, Oklahoma, um, all of the meetings were done on PowerPoint except for Jeff's, he started to use the whiteboard. And I'm not sure exactly when he started using a whiteboard. He might have been using it for a while. But after that, when, when we start to get to 2012, um, you know, I'm still trying to use a PowerPoint. And, but the, the line start, the, the light starts coming so quickly that is, most of the time, the light is coming when we're actually drawing on a whiteboard. That is, Jeff is seeing things for the first time because he's drawing them out and we're studying as a group. And so this is what happens um, at that time. So the 2520 and all these different messages, they start to be uh, drawn out in rows or lines for instruction. Now, we know also that um, uh, six was a one beyond five fingers. That's the idea, an overplus. And so 600 is, is, has to do with counting or for numbers. 
but as as we also were addressing in the in this situation mm -hmm. since there is nothing unimportant within scripture yeah we're given the name of shamgar yeah now which is a sword a sword but he's going to be using an ox goat instead okay but he's also the son of aneth right which had to do with um an answer so to answer by a sword so we're answering by a sword but the sword is using the ox goat the pointed stick right so it's the word of god but we're not just studying the bible like we used to where we're just reading the bible as a seventh-day adventist I don't think I've ever seen a Seventh day Adventist go and draw out a story on a line. Right? We would tell the story. You know, we, we can pair scripture with scripture. We'd use the Bible. But we hadn't been given the method of line upon line and to instruct people by plowing rows, right? Does, it, does that make sense then? It's opening up some understanding, yes. Okay. Okay, so so Shamgar is interesting. Now we, we get into the story of Deborah and Barak. Now, so we had come to understand, at least I understood, that we're going to look at Jabin. He's... he's now introduced in it's a different king of jabin he's an enemy he's the king of canaan that has not been uh this people hasn't been destroyed now we know that the original king jabin was killed so so this is not the same person and he's not resurrected but he's got the same name and it could be a title but it could just be a family name and maybe they didn't destroy the whole family but what we see now is that they are still there, uh, one of the enemies. So that means there's an enemy that, that this movement had not destroyed, something which came from the past that's going to rise again. And this time it rises in Parminder. Now what particularly, I mean, we can know in this sort of broad way, he's, he's bringing in Protestant methods of study. And, and actually Catholic methods of study, a type of philosophy that he's introducing into the movement. And it's a very deceptive philosophy. Uh, how many people have um, watched Parminder's series on that he did in 2010 on the 2520? I don't think I, I watched, I watched it. Yeah, I think I watched it in 2019, but don't ask me what I what I learned because I've forgotten everything. <laughs> okay, so when I seen it in um, 2012, because uh, it's one of the first things I watched after I'd been at Oklahoma as I watched Parminder's study on the 2520, um, he approached it on, on the enemy's ground. What, what do I mean by that? Where, where, where had the enemy uh, established their opposition to the 2520? What was it based upon? The Protestant understanding. And specifically, Jesenius. Yes, exactly. The Hebrew lexographer who wasn't even a Christian. Okay, so we have this Hebrew scholar who's not a Christian, and Uriah Smith is going to use his definition of the word Sheba. And and so what we normally do, so we have this somebody presenting something that's opposed to what we think. The natural thing to do. The natural man thing to do is to meet them on that battlefield. And that's what Parminder did. 
So he's going to start, and, and I did the same thing. I mean, initially, when it came to the 2520, I, I entered onto that battlefield as well, because that's what we normally do. There's opposition, and you go to where the opposition is. What's a wiser thing to do? Okay, first off, what's what's the problem of going uh, where the battle is? What's the danger there? Somebody else is picking the battle zone and the battlefield. Okay, <laughs> yeah, and, and you may lose, right? You may be won over. Now, Parminder, in 2019, he's going to reject everything that he taught in 2010 that he did in those presentations on the 2520. He's going to reject the idea that the seven times is a duration, and he's going to say it's an intensity. So he may have thought that he was wise in entering into that battle and that he was going to defeat the enemy, but instead he became overcome. He was overcome. Now, so the wiser thing to do is to go where the battle isn't. And if you're witnessing to someone and you're finding resistance to an idea, does it help to continue pushing in that place where that person has built up their defenses? What would we do otherwise? What, what's the other option? Can't we just leave that point alone and deal with something that we can find uh, that they haven't built defenses up against? Yes. Yeah. So, for instance, if you're dealing with the 2520 with Seventh-day Adventists, I don't suggest you go to Leviticus 26 and start arguing about the word Sheba and whether, you know, the 2520 is the longest time prophecy in uh, Great Controversy, page 351. Because I've done that battle. You don't win it. Because that person's just going to dig themselves in. So you go to something like the story of Joseph or the story of Ezra 7 to 10. You go to things that Seventh-day Adventists, when they see them, if they're open and honest, they will recognize that those things are true. Even if they're not open and honest, they're, they're, they're going to at least see it. Because they don't have any defenses there yet. Now they might end up building some defenses there, defenses there, you know, soon after. But you're gonna you're gonna surprise them because they never expected what you're going to present. And if they recognize that it's truth, they might be interested in looking into more. Of course, they might wait for a more convenient season as well. But that would be the wise thing to do. So Parminder, he was overcome by the enemy. I believe he is probably, you know, back in 2010, sincere in his study. But when you look at the arguments that are presented in 2010, I'm not convinced. That is, the things that, that made me understand and accept the 2520 was understanding the four seven times that Leviticus 26 was fulfilled by literal Israel in a period of 220 years from 677 to 457. And that that 220 years is attached to the 2300 days by the three decrees. This is something that Parminder never accepted. And, and he never accepted it because he didn't come up with it. Pretty much that would be my opinion. I could be wrong. But sometimes there are people, they like something when they found it. If somebody else finds it, they can't rejoice in it. They're going to oppose it. Not always openly either. So Parminder was caught up in this philosophy. He believed he was wise, that he understood things. So much so that he would use deceit to hide what he actually believed, believing that people weren't ready to listen to what he had to say. 
very similar to people like Desmond Ford. Desmond Ford concealed for, from a lot of people his beliefs regarding the 2300 days. He didn't want to tell people openly that he rejected the 2300 days, but he had for a long time before people even knew it, except maybe some of his close friends. So, so we can see that Jabin is not really the one at issue here. It's going to be Sisera. And so the message that comes to this movement is one is it's a doubled message, just like Deborah and Barak are double. We got Jabin and Sisera. But Jabin is representing papal teachings. But the captain of that host is going to be Sisera, which is going to be the message of Parminder. And he dwells in Heroshet of the Gentiles. And, and what was the purpose of that? It's this woodland near on the, on the west coast of Lake Marome. And, and it means like a carving or a cutting, like a mechanical work. So what would that be symbolizing? I'm trying to wrap my head around that symbol. Okay. Because it means woodland, but it also means, uh, because it comes from the word uh, mechanical work, 2790. It's 2799, but carving or cutting. How was, how was Parminder teaching us? He, he was trying to tell people that we could teach in parables, which we don't have the intelligence to do. Right. So that, that's one of the things. So that's going to be a bit later. But they were also, Parminder and Tess especially were making use of neuro-linguistic programming. Okay. Um, yes, I mean, they probably were. Um, I don't know if they consciously were aware of it. They had to be. Well, people can use it without being consciously aware of it. Then why recommend to people that they watch videos at high speed? Well, because they may, th well, that's what I'm saying, is they may not have known anything about neurolinguistic programming. But, but what they were doing was a type of hypnotism, which is what neurolinguistic programming is. For those that aren't really familiar with the idea, it was um, a development, it was a sales technique that was developed, a way to manipulate people. And um, it uses things like rapport that is, um, you know, modeling a person's um, mannerisms when you're communicating to them. Uh, it's communicating indirectly, so you're manipulating people, uh, one, by confusing them, so you can present um, sort of the Hege Hegelian dialectic, where you can present two opposing op uh, uh, views that have no reconciliation. Um, you confuse the person, and then you provide a reconciliation, which really isn't a reconciliation, but the per person accepts that. Um, and, of course, the idea of watching videos uh, quickly, quicker than you can think, is is not useful. It, it it can can it can hypnotize a person. A person can by repetition can start to believe something that they haven't critically considered. So he's not wanting people to have time to critically consider things. So how would we relate this to uh, cutting and carving, or um, the idea of a woodland or or um, mechanical work 
Will the symbol of someone surgically working be more apropos in this in this basis? Well, well, I think of it as kind of like the carving. I mean, you make idols by carving wood, wouldn't True. you? Right. So, so to me, there is a, um, you know, the illustration that God has is He's the potter and we're the clay. We're fashioned um, differently than we're not carved. Right. Our characters are not carved by God. They're molded by God. Where here, Parminder was basically manipulating people. Agreed. Yeah. He didn't want people, he wasn't going to be open and honest and allow people to make their own decisions. He was making the decisions for us because he knows what's best and we're too stupid to think for ourselves. Now, isn't that also very much a papal attitude? It, well, that's exactly a papal attitude. And that was what was manifested in 2019 in the question and answer period that they did. Uh, addressing that, it was basically you can't think for yourself. You need to go to good schools and um, you need to have good teachers. But until then, you should just accept what your leadership tells you. And, and that's totally opposed to the Protestant principle of the priesthood of all believers, that God can teach each of us individually. Sure, we need other, one another. We need fellowship. We need to study together. But we don't have one man or a group of men telling us what to think and who are going to do our thinking for us. Now, uh, we also then looked at uh, this 20 years. And so we addressed it, this, this addressed the 20 years um, in a chronology. And anybody remember how we addressed the 20 years? So if we go from September 11th, 2001, we can go 20 prophetic years, and that brings us to May 29th, 2021. Or we could go to September 11th, 2021, which is going to be the third day of the sixth month and a reverse symbol of, of Pentecost. It's the, the main thing here is that 20 prophetic years and 20 solar years are 105 days apart. What would be the significance of that? What is, what is 105 days? What two symbols does it give us? 2520 for one. So 2520 hours and the 10th day of the fifth month. Right. Okay. So can we see that this, um, this 10th day of the fifth month, we know comes from Ezekiel. It's the date of the destruction of the temple. It's also the second date that is July 18, but it's a Julian date in 2020. And that's going to be uh, when certain of the elders of Israel come and sit before before Ezekiel. So that's going to be before us. And that's in Ezekiel 20, 20 or 20, 20 or 20 verse one. Right. And so it came to pass in the seventh year, in the fifth month, the 10th day of the month, that certain of the elders of Israel came to inquire of the Lord and sat before me. So this is Ezekiel. And this is this movement is Ezekiel. But we're also going to have two particular verses, Ezekiel 2012. So does Ezekiel 2012 represent 2012? I had not considered it in that way, but that's possible. Okay, so, so we, did, we have considered it that way. So 2012, Ezekiel 2012 represents 2012. 
and, and 2012 is also going to be marking the end of the Mayan calendar. That is the 13th Bactun, which is 1,872,000 days. Right? And it's going to start in 313 on the Gregorian calendar on August 11th. So it's going to tie us to Samuel Snow's prophecy. But if we go to Exodus 3113, we're going to have this same verse that we just read in Ezekiel 20, uh, 2012. Speak thou unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbath ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that ye may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. So when we go to Ezekiel 20, 12, it says, Moreover, also I gave them my Sabbath to be a sign between me and them, that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctify them. So here it's in the third person, and the other one it's in uh, the second person. So he's talking directly to them. Here he's talking about them, but it's the same verse. So if we go from 3113 BC or Genesis or Exodus 3113, and we go to 2012, we know that's going to be a symbol of July 18, 2020. Anybody not follow that? Does everybody understand it quite well what I just what I just did? Okay, you made the jump from 3113 BC to right. Ezekiel 2012. Right, and that's when the Mayan calendar starts on August 11th, 3113 BC. And it's going to be 1,872,000 days to, to December 21st, 2012. And so that ties these two verses, Exodus 3113 and Ezekiel 2012 together. So that's the Mayan calendar symbol. But we know that we just don't stop there. And notice we put Parminder coming in. Well, 2012 is when he makes the prediction regarding 2014. So you could either put him in 2012 when he comes notably into this movement, or you could put him in 2014, however you want to do it. But we also have a similar verse in Ezekiel 2020. And hallow my Sabbath, and they shall be a sign between me and you that you may know that I am the Lord your God. So that is July 18, 2020. So are we, are we then to look at this in Ezekiel chapter 20? Yeah. In a similar way as what we're looking at Judges 2. Um, similar. I, I don't take, um, I mean, we could look at it, Ezekiel 20, verse 1, is marking 2001, right, the 10th day of the fifth month. Okay, now that's that that's one, yes, but I was looking at more from Ezekiel 20, 13 to Ezekiel 20, 20. Okay, so, yes, you definitely can do that. Or so from 2012 to 2020 at least. Right. I, I'm. Your point was very clear about 2012. Yeah. It. What was unclear to me was making the application with the subsequent verses leading up to 2020, because of how very blunt those verses are being presented. Right. Because this is about idolatry, isn't it? It very much, <laughs> and why they're why Jerusalem is going to be destroyed, but that's also the the same type of message that we're seeing from Judges too, and that we are seeing throughout so far the Book of Judges. Yes, definitely. So, yeah, so definitely we can apply it in that way. That's going to be the history leading up to twenty twenty. So is is this portion of the Book of Ezekiel? a repeat and enlarge of what we were seeing in Judges 2. Yes. Now, it's interesting, uh, if you look on the chat there, Iran has put a note there that when you count the gematria, 
of Ezekiel 2012. That is, you count uh, the gematria value, both um, the regular gematria and the reverse gematria. Re reverse gematria, um, you know, um, is that what's happening there? You're doing the reverse, the combined gematria is 2781. So it's 2,781 altogether, that verse, if you combine it forwards and backwards. That is, in reverse gematria, Z becomes 1, and Y becomes 2. In regular gematria, A is 1 and B is 2. And so he's taking both the forward and the reverse and combining them, and you get all of the numbers uh, from July 18, 2020, just in a different order. You got the 2, 7, 8, 1. <clears throat> so, so we can see that this is a message of July 18, 2020, that is going to be um, addressed here in response to the error of idol worship, of following the papacy, of false methods of study. Anything else? Anyone? The uh, the fearful verse that that comes with Ezekiel twenty twenty four and twenty twenty five. Yeah, because they had not executed my judgments, but had despised my statutes and had polluted my sabbaths. And their eyes were after their father's idols. Wherefore, I gave them also statutes that were not good and judgments whereby they should not live. Isn't this a, a very direct presentation to those that are choosing to follow the wrong method of study? Mm hmm. So with all that we're talking about here, especially in the representation, again, with this, with the Sunday law, mm -hmm. are we not being presented with a choice mm -hmm. where we have a choice to accept the righteousness of Christ as our righteousness or we choose to accept that which the world sees as righteousness and reject Christ. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. So we're being brought to an understanding, a clear understanding of what it truly means for righteousness by faith. Which is Mrs. Uh, what Mrs. White has said is indeed the third angel's message, right? Mm -hmm. Yet we do not have a clear understanding of what righteousness by faith truly is. Well, because it needs to be experienced. Right. Because it is an experience, not an intellectual understanding. Yeah. So, well, yeah. The, the first and the second angel's message cannot be an intellectual understanding. It needs to be experienced just as well. Well, and they also are righteousness by faith. But Ellen White says that righteousness by faith is the third angel's message in verity. And what she means by that is not that the third angel's message is the message of righteousness by faith which many people read it that way. They think, well, if we're preaching the third angel's message, that's just the message of righteousness by faith, and the first and second angel's messages aren't righteousness by faith. They are. They're just not righteousness by faith in verity or in reality. That is, the third angel's message is the experience of righteousness by faith in the life. That is, we have Christ's character. And, and that's what uh, 
the basic problem with the, you know, looking at the third angel's message as the only message. Well, without the first two, you can't develop a Christ-like character. You, you can't just get to the end without traveling the journey. You can't get to heaven without a cross. But people want to have their cake and eat it too. But they want the simple way of the gospel. They want the shortcut. They want the quick fix. The they cliff have, notes. Yeah. They want to have, they want to have, they want to be God's special people, but they don't want to count the cost of what that means. They want to have the praise and honor of men. They want to have the influence with their friends and neighbors. But they want to do that without having of the experience that's needed so that they can be an influence. And they're jealous of others who have the character of Christ. They stone the prophets. They're involved in character assassination of those who are presenting the message that God has given the burden of the work to, and they're not going to support that. So this is, this is just a reality of throughout all history. So that's why we have the first and second angels' messages. It's an experience that leads us to a perfection of character that we can then stand at the Sunday law. See, this is this is what's been getting me because there are those that believe that the third angel's message is being presented currently within the corporate church. There are others that believe that Walter Weith is giving the third angel's message and that he should he and he alone should be supported there have been those in the past uh, such as one pastor that wrote a book called his robe or mine yeah that all of them attempt to represent elements but they don't have the entire message. Yeah. Well, I'm not too impressed by that book, um, His Rover Mind. But anyway. I had, a, I had a friend that was hugely impressed with it, sent me their copy. I read it. I just, it, it did not have the same type of power that the initial elements presented by jones and wagner had or just in the spirit of prophecy desire of ages extremely powerful book on righteousness by faith right and and but the whole thing about righteousness by faith is it's simply obedience it's right doing by faith but it's not surface but people want to have some kind of trick some little thing that that can get you there without a cross and it just doesn't exist as you said they want the shortcut yeah because we have to take up our cross daily and those trials that we face uh, the crises in our lives the things that are disappointments that are discouragements the things that we struggle with the things that make us cling to christ because there is nothing else. Those are the things that are transformative, that are going to change our character so that it's like Christ's. But those are the things that we don't want. If you avoid the cross, you don't have the crown. So... But you can see here, as we're, uh, we're we're addressing these points here, we have 
all of these symbols that point to this period of time from from 9 11 to 2021 which is the time of our our line right and we have this symbol of the 20 years we also used as dealing with 20 months and that's going to start with uh the 777 uh structure from september 23rd 2017 to um uh, September 7th, but in a sort of a roundabout way. So uh, I'm not going to go into showing that again, <coughs> again but uh, so we can tie together um, uh, the, the introduction of a message on July 18th to September 7th, and that is the 200th lunar month from September 11th is September 23rd, 2017. And the 200th um, prophetic month is January 15th, 2018, and it's 20 prophetic months to September 7th, 2019, and it's 20 lunar months to August 29th, 2019. So that 220 months to September 7th from September 11th, 18 years later, um, is part of this structure. So, I mean, I could show it to you again, but the basic idea then is what we're saying is that this period of time that's being marked here is a period of time that began at September 11th. That is, that's what this history is of this movement. But this here is not going to be starting at se September 11th, per se. This is this is dealing with Parminder. He's going to come in later. It's one of the enemies, though, that has been left. And so his message is going to be addressed by Barak and by Deborah. This these symbols, and also by Heber and Jael. So, so we're, we're going to have to somehow put these onto a line. I mean, we can put it on the line, like on the whiteboard, where I just have, you know, it's 2014. But we're going to see that it obviously continues past that. So maybe it's 2012 even, the beginning of this. But it's going to go all the way to at least 2023. So um, now Deborah, it says, it was a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, and she judged Israel at that time. And we're gonna we're gonna pick this up tomorrow at that point, um, and try to understand what this is talking about. I mean, we've already gone through it, but we we need to uh, somehow. Um, figure this out and and I would say and so my initial idea is that Deborah can represent a uh, spirit of prophecy that's possible it also could represent the movement that is using the spirit of prophecy to guide it so it could refer to FFA but I'll let people think about that um, before tomorrow. Any final comments? Not for me at the moment. Okay. No one else? Okay, let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so very thankful for the study this morning. And we know, Lord, that our minds are weak, that many of these things that we had studied in the past few weeks are still vague in our memories. And we just ask, Lord, that as we continue to go over this ground, that we can refine our understanding, 
uh, that we can see things that we have never seen, that we can dig up old truths and discover them and place them in their proper setting. We pray, Lord, that you can bless each person, help them in their day-to-day -day struggle and walk with you. Help us to cling to you since you are all that we have. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.